Wedgeside Podcast is a proud member of the Wedgeside Media Collective. This episode is sponsored by Rockwell Schwartz. Rockwell would like to send a shout out to Tamerlane Farm Animal Sanctuary in New Jersey, where they listen to the podcast while mucking barns, and for the sanctuary's dedication to providing care to disabled chickens. You know, I went and checked out their their website, and they sell hot sauces to help uh, the the sanctuary. So I'm gonna get some. They have the the smoked red hot sauce. Check it out. Links in the show notes. Looks fucking amazing. Tamerlanefarm.com. This is episode 154. We have Justin and Amanda on from No New Animal Lab. Yeah, they just finished one of their tours. They're, they have a bunch of new stuff coming up. Um, make sure to follow what they're doing. It's pretty amazing work. Um, and really, I just love the grassroots aspect and the, the, the pressure campaign that they're, they're, they're using. Um, I love it. So stick around for that. It's a really fun conversation. What news and events do we have going on this week, Jordan? Well, if you're listening to this on the day that it was released and you're in Salt Lake City, you could come to the Salt Lake City Anarchist Black Cross Prisoner Letter Writing Night. That'll be at the library at 730. If you don't live in Salt Lake and or you miss that, write a damn prisoner anyways. Sorry. No, that's it. That's it? I don't have anything else. If you have anything going on in your neck of the woods, email Jordan, jordan at wishsidepodcast.com. He'd love to talk about it. So this week's listener shout out comes from Charlotte Malrich. Charlotte said that we can do anything that we want to do again. So we're going to promote ourselves a little bit. Not just ourselves. No. You know, um, new member of the collective, Little Punk's Vegan Kitchen, um, released their first episode. Um, That's my daughter, by the way. Uh, She cooks hot dog surprise. And pizza roll-ups. So check that out. As well as we just did the vegan tin can challenge, Jeremy and I. So both of those are on YouTube. And you can watch them now. I'm going to slingshot this over to Jeremy. What the hell? There, there's, there's no uplifting ones this week, really. What pow? I know. But October 24th, 1929. Oh, you know what this is? Oh, come on. It's Black Thursday. Stock market crash. Great Depression began. Cool story. Yeah. I mean, it's capitalism, right? If you like these little tidbits of history, we get them out of the Slingshot Personal Organizer. Pick one up yourself at a local info shop or an online info shop like AK Press. The 2016 version's out. Get it while it's hot. Hot, hot, hot. I sincerely hope you enjoy this episode. Which side are you on? Which side are you on? Which side are you on? Which side? Which side are you on? 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 So how how's your day going? Um, it's good. I've just been okay. doing yeah. just doing campaign work and some other stuff. Um, how how are y'all all doing? I just literally got home from work, so now it's you know second job stuff. <laughs> oh, shit. So no, but it's good. It's good. Um, you guys have been super busy though with the with your tour, right? Yeah, we just got back. I guess it's been two or three weeks now. Like two weeks ish. Uh, yeah, we were gone for forty days on that, so it was it was quite the tour. Forty days and about thirty different stops 
um, including both presentations and like partially a speaking tour and also protests. So I think 30 different cities around the U.S. and sometimes multiple stops in one day, multiple states in one day. So all of that culminating in the, the second march on the University of Washington. So it's sort of downtime, but we've basically just immediately gone back to the drawing board for new ideas in the next several months of the campaign, getting ready for future stuff. What is it like to prepare for like a tour like that, that is just so massive? Like you're saying multiple states in the same day. Like that just, my mind goes, holy fuck. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um, well, Justin and I have toured a few times together, um, and I had done several different animal rights tours before that. So we've luckily had um, a lot of experience with putting a tour together and great contacts throughout the country who were able to get in touch with um, about either protests or presentations in different cities. Um, and it's a lot of just trying to get as organized as we can before we hit the road. And then, of course, always while we're on the road, still um, – planning future dates because there's never enough time to get everything done. So uh, how, how do you take care of yourself mentally doing this whole process to make sure you don't just completely collapse of mental exhaustion or physical exhaustion for that matter? Um, <laughs> We're not good at that. <laughs> yeah, I'm not, um, I, yeah, I don't know if we would answer that in a way that would be satisfying. <laughs> um we the, actually the thing I was going to say to follow up with what Amanda said was that it is super draining and we don't really take care of ourselves. I mean, we eat like shit on the road. For anyone who's traveled a lot, um, uh, having a vegan diet, there's not a ton of options in some parts of the country. Um, you're kind of left with whatever you can scrape together from a grocery store or fast food place, like Taco Bell or something like that. So, and we did not sleep nearly as much as we we should have, but. Um, I mean, that's kind of what it takes to do stuff like several states in one. I mean, we wanted to be realistic about how long we were able to be gone. I mean, we could have done a tour like that over two and a half months or three months and, and spent a little bit more time in each place and make sure that we you know, ate better and we slept better. But we needed to be back for certain things and we could really only cram it in 40 days. So. It was sort of irresponsible, <laughs> um, but we also didn't want to compromise um, not going to certain places, par partially because we wanted to touch base with different communities, um, and also because there were certain campaign targets that we didn't want to pass up because you know we can only go on tour like once, maybe twice a year, and so if if it meant like going out of our way to go to like Evansville, Indiana, which we did. Um, just because there were campaign targets there, then we tried to fit it in. And mm -hmm. it's it, it meant that we had to like do a couple overnight drives, but it was okay. Sometimes it's kind of fun, too, if we're protesting, like, say, a Skonsk office in one state in the morning, and then to be at someone's, some executive's house in another state that evening, they're probably not expecting it. So um, it keeps them on their toes a bit, too, when we are yeah, to pull off some of that stuff. You know... When you're out there every single day like that, it's completely exhausting. But when you get old and you don't do it, like I haven't done it in years, you kind of really begin to miss it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's the other thing is, and we the people that we've been on the road with too. It's it's always like a point of persuasion to say when why would you pass something like this up? You know, I mean, especially because there's just not a lot of touring in the animal rights movement now as, as opposed to say like 10 years ago or so for, for things like the chat campaign stuff mm -hmm. that we're trying to normalize the idea of traveling for for campaigns or for network building for movement building and so um you know if you can if you have the means and you're like physically able to do so it's it really people should not pass up those opportunities even if it's like a short west coast tour or just like a few states of traveling around or something if you can do something like that you should do it you mentioned like uh, eating like shit and stopping at places like Taco Bell. I like to get the little tips and tricks from people of like what they do in those <laughs> situations. Cause well, there's only like a handful of things you can order. I like a place like Taco Bell. So everyone I know has their own little secret of like how they mix and match and build their own, like better thing that's offered on the menu. So, so what, what is yours for Taco Bell? 
Well, Amanda's a lot pickier than me, so she should go. Oh, and mine's just... boring at Taco Bell. I just get rice and beans, and then I put a bunch of the hot sauce on it. <laughs> it's boring, but it's like a far more difficult for Taco Bell to actually figure out how to make that <laughs> than just because they have to. They have to basically pick something that exists on the menu, and then uh, subtract all the stuff that she doesn't want because she doesn't eat onions. And so it's, it's always a bigger headache to go through and ask for just rice and beans than it is to say like a bean burrito fresco style add potatoes, which is normally what the rest of us get. Um, sometimes add rice. It's easier to add things than to subtract things at fast food places. So we also have tourist sandwiches. That's yeah. a special sandwich that we make that's peanut butter, strawberry jelly, sriracha, uh, hot sauce, and... <laughs> Yes, and chips. on a sandwich. Yeah, what kind of chips? Few, That's going to make or break like it. Corn for me. chip. Okay. Corn okay. chips. I can't be. I mean, you can totally be potato chips. Uh-huh. I think that we did that once or twice, also, just to mix it up. You know. <laughs> That's an interesting combination I, to get the peanut butter, hot sauce, and sriracha on there. Uh huh. It only works on tour. I can't like. <laughs> Yeah, I've tried eating that. it at home, being like, "Oh yeah, that sandwich was so good when we were traveling." Then I made it at home, and I was, "This isn't that good. <laughs> it's <laughs> only good in the country when you haven't eaten a normal meal in a while." If you're um, if you're in the South, it's at, you can actually go. We, we made a few stops at Waffle House, um, which you can if you can get just uh, hash browns with like shitty canned vegetables and stuff like that mixed in that's not bad um it's better than eating taco bell every single time and um waffle house is kind of cool and that they kind of sort of have an anti-oppression policy <laughs> i mean it's it's pretty weak but in the realm of like corporate fast food it's pretty strong so it's kind of cool that they have like a policy in place there about dis- discrimination against either employees or customers and so it's that's kind of interesting and that's what we did in the south and then we talk a lot about eating like shit, and we do, but um, I think for a lot of people on the road, we probably ate pretty – I mean, we would make banh mi's as frequently as we could, which is a lot more difficult to do in a car than to make peanut butter and jelly with chips and hot sauce. But that's another one of the things that kept uh, kept us satisfied on the road with food. Um, most places have tofu. Most places have cilantro, and that's really – the staple of cilantro anyway. You know, one thing that, that I've gotten to with talking to a lot of people who travel is they say um, when you're going from city to city, that sucks. But now there's so many good vegan places in every single city. And when you get there, everyone wants to be like, look at the awesome shit we have in my town. Let me show you our awesome bakery. And they just eat like shit because it's all vegan junk food, not because there's not a lot available. <laughs> Did you guys like experience yeah. the same thing? That's yeah, definitely. that's definitely true. We definitely, yeah, ate a lot of vegan food in cities that tasted good, but that probably wasn't great for us. <laughs> definitely made us tired. <laughs> was was there any place that you, everyone's like, "Oh, this is amazing"? You went there, and you're like, "This fucking sucks." Uh, I don't. I think don't think so. it was quite that. <laughs> quite that. Ex- Dream. I mean, most people talk up their their own towns quite a bit. Um, mm-hmm. I would say, I don't know. Nothing, nothing stands Shit. out to me. We were usually Shit. excited to find places in town. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think everything in New York is kind of overrated, <laughs> except for Marion Dim Sum House. That place is fucking awesome. Yeah, that was <laughs> like one of the best places we went all on tour. But Champs is really expensive and. Uh, just makes you feel like shit afterwards. <laughs> it's good, but it just totally makes you feel like shit. So if you can avoid that and eat all many other vegan food that exists in New York City, you might want to try something else if you're traveling. So were you mainly sleeping in the van or the car or on people's couches or in hotels? Uh, we would sleep in the uh, car while we were driving. Uh, we had a few overnight drives and then sometimes we would sleep during the day. Um, and then, um, it was a mixture of, we would camp when we could, when there was some place to do that. And that was always the best. Um, and then 
a lot of people that we had connections with in cities would let us crash at their places on the floor in a spare room or whatever they had. And then um, there were times when we would get hotels when there weren't other options. So a mixture. One of the things I love to talk to other activists about is their origin stories. And like, I know people, we get asked all the time, oh, like what made you vegan? And that I love hearing those too. But what not only made you guys become vegan, but also like what led to your activism in the culmination of like where you're at today? Um, you can go first if okay. you want. Um, so when I was five, I found out that meat came from killing animals. And so that night at dinner, I told my parents that I wasn't eating meat anymore. Um, so that's when I became vegetarian and then just loved animals growing up. Like I grew up down the street from cows um, and I just always loved the animals. And then when I was in college, so I did a ton of research and realized that um, because of the reasons that I care about being vegetarian, I had to be vegan. Um, and then it was also through doing that research that um, learning more about what I actually happened to the animals I literally couldn't sleep at night without thinking about it so I decided that I had to do more so I started um, just getting involved locally um, at my school and in, I lived in Seattle at the time um, and doing that and then just kept getting more and more involved in stuff um, my story is a bit more expedited and probably sounds less honorable than that um <laughs> i uh in high school the person i was dating um we're still we're still pretty close now but um back then she God, i was like 15 or something um we were both 15 she was already in the process of going vegan and we started dating um and i was pretty i was sort of the typical devil's advocate white guy um in high school um, and we, it was, it was like playful debating a lot of the time about, about things like animal rights, but I tried to be supportive of things that she was doing. Like she started a high school animal rights group and I grew up in rural Oregon and, um, a lot of rural Oregon is much like other places, in the West, a lot of, um, a lot of hunting culture. Um, and this part of, I mean, most places outside of Portland is something that people probably don't realize about Oregon are actually extremely um, rooted in white supremacy. Uh, lots of the Northwest has a lot of those tendencies. There's a lot of little, little hotbed enclaves for um, white supremacist organizations and stuff like that. So this is sort of just a racist um, hunting town. And so she had an animal rights group in high school here. And I, I mean, she was like the only person that was trying to get stuff going. And I just was supportive of her because of that. And then um, basically felt like I was on the losing end of arguments for quite some time and I'd, I'd seen the footage I had like read the horror stories about where um, animal products came from the processes and all that stuff but it really wasn't it was more that I felt like I couldn't really argue with her that she was always like clearly right and I was wrong and I realized that there was some kind of cognitive dissonance and the only way for me to resolve it was to um, was to go vegetarian for a few months and then I became vegan. And then uh, I moved to Portland. We moved to Portland together and started getting involved in Animal Defense League chapter here. And then it kind of all sort of snowballed really quickly. I was I lived in an activist house with, with folks that did things like um, Earth First, uh, like Forest Defense Organizing, also did Rising Tide, um, and uh, met folks that were doing like prison abolition work and stuff like that. And then, so it all quickly just became... Um, just stuff I was getting involved in very rapidly. And at 18, I was already um, sort of de facto doing organizing for Animal Defense League because a lot of other folks weren't stepping up to the plate. So it all kind of happened fast and more or less has just been a struggle to um, find like animal advocacy work that's like worth sustaining ever since then. Um, and that's a whole nother discussion, but I was quickly disappointed in the animal liberation movement and basically it's just been a search for something better um, since those days. So, so you, you talk about like, um, like the ADL days, like ADL for me, like you go back into like the early two thousands, late nineties. And that's like the pinnacle of animal rights organizing for me. Like when I think of like the heyday for myself, it's all the different ADLs all, all over the country, like kind of 
semi collaborating, working together, but still autonomous, you know, mm-hmm. um, and you don't really hear about ADLs anymore. Like what, what really do you think caused the decline? Do you, do you really think it was mainly just the whole shack stuff or was there more to it than that? Um, I don't know. I remember, I think we were both on like the ADL, like listserv that used to exist, like five or six years ago or something like that. It was sort of like the last attempt to, um, to keep the different animal defense, the last like remaining animal defense league chapter is networked. I'm mm-hmm. um, aware of like what was going on. I remember it was like affiliate ADL, SLC, yeah, we were there. Portland and, and maybe one or two other ones, not a lot. Um, I do think it, I personally think it probably had a lot, a lot to do with Shaq. Also, I think just a general shift away from that kind of organizing and moving, moving towards, um, vegan education overall, like a lot of resources went into that, in that direction. Groups, groups that started out relatively small, like mercy for animals just exploded. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that those groups essentially took advantage of a state of repression where they were able to consolidate their own power in the movement by saying like, this is a safe, uh, you know, so-called like safe form of activism. Um, I also think a lot of it is like a lot of ADL chapters, there was probably a lot of problematic behavior realistically that I think was going unaddressed um, by organizers. And I think a lot of those chapters kind of fell apart because um, they also had their own problems and like were places where like sort of bro machismo animal rights stuff like started. I mean, the first ADL was a hardline group in, in mm-hmm. New York and, um, you know, has, I think there's always been those, those tendencies and I think that eventually it sort of consumed itself. Um, but I also think people just became afraid of doing the kind of stuff that ADLs are famous for doing. I don't know if you have any more thoughts on that. Um, something that's been kind of interesting with this campaign though, is that there have been a couple of ADL chapters that have started, um, with people wanting to just go into a protest in New York, Francisco. So it's, still a different vibe than what there used to be, but it's been kind of cool to see um, ADLs coming back. That's true. Yeah. I mean, personally, I would love to see like a resurgence, but like a more um, almost mature resurgence. Like you're saying, like there was there, that whole um, culture really did exist. I think it was a lot of people very young in their activism and weren't fully formed in how to like self-reflect on their different aspects, whether that's the internal you know, racism or sexism that we all have and, and know how to really deal with that on an outward level. It's true. But, yeah. Um, I mean, I was only like the tail end of, I mean, like, like you said, the heyday was like the mid, late 90s. There were ADL shots. You could look at like a, a no compromise from that era and see listed in their, um, in the trenches section, like dozens of groups either using the ADL name or, uh, groups like DART, which considered themselves part of the ADL network, but didn't mm-hmm. have those the ADL in their name, and they were they were they were in almost every major city. Um, when I got involved, it was already like falling apart, and I think that's I think a lot of that just has to do with um, sort of a, a movement shift that people don't really address, which was um, the upward mobilization of resources into like large nonprofit groups. And I, I don't think it's just ADL that suffered. I think it's any grassroots animal liberation stuff, uh, really. I mean, I think ADL is maybe the, the, the pinnacle of that representation, mm-hmm. but it was the whole grassroots movement that started to dissolve uh, in, I don't know, 2005 to now, maybe. That's roughly. One, one thing that I've noticed is, is a, a pretty big resurgence, and I would say the last probably 18 months of real collaborative grassroots or- organizing, not just around lifestyle, um, which to me is fantastic. Like, um, and, and not that I'm putting down anyone who organizes around vegan and lifestyle. It's just not my personal forte, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but that's why like, I, I love seeing like what you guys are doing where, where you, you're making a conservative effort to focus on like vivisection, right? Um, where you don't really see that as much because it, it's a, I find it a lot harder for a lot of activists to have those types of discussions with people and go to those protests um, around like things like vivisection instead of it's just like, well, you know, we don't like cages, you know. Mm-hmm. That's true. Yeah. So, so what yeah. led to, to 
both of you to decide to focus on this one issue of vivisection right now? Uh, um, I guess to get into a bit of how the campaign started, um, I did do a lot of like vegan education and advocacy um, when I was getting started for the first few years. And then I lived in California for a bit and I was involved in kind of the tail end of shack stuff there. Um, and then I moved back to the Northwest and had been kind of wanting to do more of that kind of campaigning again. Um, I like that with pressure campaigns, it's, you know, it, unlike vegan advocacy, it's, I'm tired of asking people to make changes. Um, mm -hmm. And like, we don't have time for that. And I like that with pressure campaigns, it's forcing change to happen. Um, and vivisection campaigns can lend themselves um, well to that. Um, and so I was kind of wanting something like that. I had been involved in um, I've been in the Gateway to Hell campaign and been trying to do more national networking. And then and it was in the midst of all that that um, I read an article in the Seattle Times about how the University of Washington was planning to build a new underground animal lab. Um, and I started organizing some protests against that as the regents were leading up to their vote on that. Um, ended up filing a lawsuit against them for the illegal way in which they went about the vote. Um, and then as they were planning to do another vote for the lab, I'd been in touch with Justin, who was, I was in Seattle at the time, he was in Portland, and we decided to do a little like Northwest Convergence to have a you know stage of disruption at that meeting. And then it was after that that we found out that Skanska was the construction company that we built in the lab. Um, and having a construction company there that's less invested in animal research than a university that's making $500 million a year off of animal research gave us an interesting angle to be able to have um, this campaign. So um, we, like in the talks we do and stuff that in a lot of ways this fell into our laps, um, that it is a vivisection campaign, which um, we, you know, there's cool things about getting to do something that's not vegan focused um, and that brings in people who aren't vegan and we can be like welcoming and build relationships with other people. Um, and then it, Skanska gave us a unique way to be able to protest um, university research because it's a corporation that has offices all over the country as well as around the world. So we can um, also start to plug in the network that we're wanting to build. Can I add to that, Justin? Um, I th to t touch on sort of mentioning the general trend of talking about veganism or sort of talking about um, maybe not specifically veganism, but, but animals that are used for, for agriculture, animals that are used for food production. Mm -hmm. I think that a lot of person they say, 11 billion or so animals in the U S that are used for food versus, um, you know, I think a, tens of millions that are used for, for research. And they think that like the numbers are really where, like what it should come down to when we talk about what our priorities are in, in terms of like developing campaigns or something. Um, and there's a, there's definitely a shift in the grassroots too. I mean, organizations, um, with organizations such as like two, six, nine or DXC specifically focus on that. I think largely because, the numbers um, and people ask why focus on vivisection or something like fur where the, um, the numbers of animals used are, are less staggering than animal agriculture. Um, and, you know, I think really when you talk about campaigns, that's that people get caught up on that kind of thing. And um, there's definitely a, a people advocating for like a shift away from vivisection campaigns in the, in like a post shack era, like, we need to have different priorities because the vivisection industry is is small compared to these other things, et cetera. But the way the industries function are just so so very different, and the kinds of the kinds of campaigns you can organize around those industries to pressure change is very, very different. And I think that if you are interested in building up a pressure campaign that you know has a diversity of tactics model that is about building grassroots networks, um, vivisection is still offers. I think it still offers some of this, the best, most vulnerable pressure points as an industry, even more so than the fur industry, which is actually on a personal level, I feel like where my heart is most often pulled is towards animals that are exploited for fur, either wild, caught, captured, 
or or ones that are farmed. But um, strategically, it's you look at the way the industries work, and vivisection is the one where most people can get involved in various ways, and it's a way to rebuild a movement. As Amanda said, we can have a campaign um, against the university uh, and through this construction company. That those opportunities are often don't lend themselves um, with these other sorts of industries that are exploiting animals. And so it's not, it's not the vivisection is the thing that stands out, at least for me personally, as the, the most egregious form of animal exploitation or something. It's that um, it's an industry where we can exercise this kind of campaign model. And it's also more realistically more vulnerable than something as entrenched as, as animal agriculture. Mm-hmm. Um, and, I, and I think that's why you see pressure campaigns against the vivisection industry so much more than you would in, in other, in sort of other sorts of uh, animal exploitation industries. It's, it's funny to me that you mentioned fur because for myself, that's like my personal, I don't want to say favorite campaign, but it's like it holds my special place in, in my heart kind of like that's, Maybe it's just because where I grew up and I grew up around meat farms and, and other, you know, how my activism has been over the years has, has kind of focused towards that. But that's always kind of like what I lean towards. Like, um, I'm 10 times more likely to organize against the furniture industry than, let's say, like a circus, even though to me they're both horrible and atrocious, right? Um, mm-hmm. I just sure. feel, you know, I think everyone kind of has their own little, little niches. But I like that you guys are talking about, like, the pressure campaigns. And so what... What lessons, both good and bad, have you guys taken from the Shack campaign and incorporated for yourselves? <laughs> That's a big oh, question. <laughs> um, I mean, obviously, uh, we are, I mean, looking at the campaign we're doing, um, and, you know, we both were involved in some of the tail end of Shack protest, um, and it has had a big influence, and we do very much look to it, but we also... We want to learn the good and the bad. Um, and we also want to look at like what the real story of Shaq was. Um, I think there are a lot of misconceptions about it. Uh, mm-hmm. Different stories get told in the movement. Um, and so like we've made an effort to talk to the different um, Shaq organizers, like you know, people who are part of the Shaq 7, um, and hear from them you know what their stories are and what they learned from their experiences um, and to be influenced by that. Do you feel comfortable in sharing any of those lessons learned that you guys got? I mean, I think we could talk about lessons learned um, generally. I mean, for, for one, to play off of what Amanda said, um, Shaq is a mythology in the animal rights community for mm-hmm. good for good or bad, it is. I think that um, it's it's it sort of ends up being these like two two versions of the story, which are sometimes conflicting. That Shaq was the most effective, maybe the the apex of like strategic thinking in the global animal rights community, like the most had the most impact. You know, it brought Wall Street to its knees, and this this narrative that we employ that was like they used really high pressure tactics. There was a strong um, strategic um, complementarity to above ground and underground and all this stuff. Yet at the same time, we talk about, say, the Shack 7 or the people that were indicted and convicted in the UK under Operation Achilles. And we say like, oh, those people are just, you know, they were just advocating free speech and this is just a speech issue. And these are two maybe not completely honest representations of the story. Um, and not to say that we have the answers, but it's been kind of a quest to figure out like, can, how do we have a conversation about the model and then the way that it played out and some of the mistakes that Shaq, not the organizers of the campaign necessarily, but people all over the country and all over the world that participated in the campaign, the kinds of things that should have been, um, maybe called out as, as a tactic that should not have been supported, uh, versus the model itself, which, I think that's what we take away is that it's still a really great model. I mean, mm-hmm. it's something that can, I mean, Brian Cass himself said that that model could be employed against any industry in the world and have similar effects. And I think that you could look at that quote and, and know that the model can stand alone. And that doesn't mean that the animal rights movement played out, used the model to the most, the most appropriate way or, that it was uh, 
that 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 means that we need to toe the line of like supporting any action under the banner of diversity of tactics. And I think when we talk about what we wouldn't do, what we've learned is that there are some things like maybe too far removed targeting, uh, going past tertiary, you know, targeting people that were part of the families of people that were already very removed from HLS or um, that we, you know, we're, we're, we think very carefully about like how, how far removed do we want to be from UW or from Skanska? Um, because I think towards the end of the chat campaign for people that were involved, you were standing outside of small bank branches that were subsidiaries of an organization that was the, you know, biggest <laughs> investor in a customer of HLS, which was already very removed, you know? Um, yeah. And I didn't like standing outside of like tiny ATMs, you know, <laughs> and, that's, and again, that's not, that's not to discredit the model. I think that what that means is that people were desperate to do something, especially in the wake of repression, we were desperate to keep it going. And we ended up doing things that, that probably harmed our own reputation to some extent. Um, but I, I mean, those are sort of generalities. I don't know if you want to add anything. Mm. I don't know. I mean, there were like, you know, we've heard stories and probably don't need to share those things for people. But, um, you know, I mean, I think that there are a lot of people that are, were involved um, that are very critical of the campaign. And we as a movement are sort of um, oftentimes not willing to hear the criticism because we want to remember the legacy. But mm -hmm. obviously things didn't play out the way the organizers had intended in 1999. It wasn't supposed to be a campaign that lasted that long. Um, and, you know, I mean, some, some of it's like, you know, when the U.S. government or the U.K. government bails them out, that's like, fuck you, that's cheating. Um, but nevertheless, it's like there were things that they didn't anticipate. Um, there were developments that you can't anticipate. And how, how do we remain adaptable um to the changing landscape of our opponents is a huge lesson that i think anyone should take away from anything like that um and going into it with a little less arrogance would probably also be useful um i think that's part of the reason that there's an allure but it's also part of the downfall to some extent you know one thing that, that i've taken away after talking to this like uh activists like, and organizers in depth for a while is that everyone wants to have a really good in-depth conversation of tactics but yet it seems like it's impossible to get people to actually have a civil conversation about tactics that's true yeah so it's difficult like how do we bridge that gap where we all recognize that we we really need to have some some hard discussions about it but how do we bridge that gap to actually get it and and make it positive you know a positive outcome not just bickering and uh you know people breaking away yeah, i mean part of that's just the difficulty of how we tend to communicate in this country um and i i mean and in you know to talk about in the animal rights movement there's a lot of ego that's involved and that can make organizing and being critical of the work we do very difficult like but i know that we try try to, you know, constantly kind of regroup and look at what we're doing and be critical of the work. And we should start looking at that as a positive thing rather than as a negative thing. Um, we should not be going through any campaign without ever stopping to look at like what went right as well as what went wrong mm -hmm. and then make changes moving forward. And like we try to have conversations like that with the people that we work with and the different um even campaigns outside of the animal rights movement or other campaigns within the movement, people that we have relationships with, we try and have those conversations um, and we try and make it, you know, as normal as we can and are organizing to, you know, step back and have those conversations on a regular basis. But it's definitely needed in a broader scale. Um, I hope that it happens in better ways at some point, but unfortunately right now I just feel like there's a lot of ego in the movement and, you know, yeah, conversation can be difficult. One of the things that we've been hearing a lot lately is that um, a lot of people feel that resistance ecology is the one like, kind of bridging that gap right now the best the best possible way. Um, <laughs> uh, well, that's nice to hear. Um, I was one of the organizers of that conference. Um, 
I think, I mean, that, that's part of it too, is, is I think if we were better at things like coalition building or um, having better internal anti-oppression politics or dealing with ourselves in, in accountable ways um, as a movement, then having any sort of contentious discussion would be easier. For one, maybe humble ourselves a little bit and realize that the animal rights community itself is very young. It's very privileged um, and it's incredibly isolated. Yet we think that we're the heralds of the future of like the, the everyone, everyone else has yet to quote unquote evolve um, as like condescending and as colonial that term is to, to apply to people that are not yet vegan or whatever, or who are not consider themselves, consider themselves animal advocates um, is a huge, it's definitely a root of a lot of our problems. I mean, if we, if we're able to seat ourselves in a context of other communities and other movements, oppressed communities, marginalized communities that are resisting every day just to exist, then maybe we would be humbled enough to, if someone said, I disagree with that tactic, it wouldn't turn into this huge Facebook explosion where <laughs> people are, you know, completely exiling um, other people from the community and from the movement. Um, and I do think that we would also learn a lot more about other ways to approach organizing, other ways to approach movement building, if we had those kinds of discussions, genuine, you know, good faith relationships with other movements and other communities, um, because we are doing a tiny microcosm of, of work in the world um, as animal advocates, and we're only employing like a tiny amount of tactics, and we're only thinking about a tiny amount of ways to, to challenge power. Um, Yet all this whole like vast array of things that are going on all around us and we're completely fucking ignorant of it as generally, at least as a movement. Mm -hmm. So I think, I do think like focusing on coalition building um, and focusing, focusing on maintaining anti-oppression uh, politics and analysis internally as a movement would, would help. Um, I think a lot of it is also that we're so focused on our own lifestyles. Again, that shift towards vegan education and vegan advocacy as opposed to animal advocacy. And I don't think that they're the same thing um, has left everything to be like very attached to our identity. So if you question our tactics, you're somehow questioning us as people as opposed to just the tactic. Um, maybe if we were focused less on being compassionate people, which is very self-centered when you think about it and more about what's effective for animals, then we would have better ways to measure those things. You just you just left me like deep in thought. Sorry. <clears throat> um. So, with with resistance ecology, is that something you guys? Um, I shouldn't say you guys, but is that something that is going to be a, uh, an annual thing, like uh, um, for the foreseeable future? Um, it has been annual for the last three years. Um. The future, I should say that this is not not something that we've discussed publicly, but the future of it um, will be changing, uh, is, is going to be transforming into some new different projects that follow along that same trajectory. Basically, um, what can we do to build a real grassroots animal liberation movement mm -hmm. that focuses on effective campaigning, that focuses on coalition building and focuses on um, both internal and external solidarity, but it doesn't, it's not going to be the same thing as it was the last three years. Um, and I guess I'll sort of just leave it at that. It'd be exciting. Look out for new stuff um, in the coming months, announcements about those things. Um, there'll be hopefully more um, exciting things on that front. Well, we, we were both super bummed that we weren't able to, to go this last year um, just because of how work schedules and everything worked out. But um, due to like financials and everything else, we kind of have to, you know, pick and choose. And we've already made sure that that's going to be our next one. Like that's what our choice is it, over things like the AR national conference and things like that. That's good. Cause the AR conference is a joke. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, <Sorry>. yeah, but <laughs> um, that's yeah. That, that yeah. Well, um, in the next few months, we'll we'll you'll see some announcements coming from Resistance Ecology about the transformation of some of those projects. Great, um, and hopefully, um, 
people won't have to go to Portland every time they want to engage in something like that. Um, that's one of the things we'd like to see is uh, people organizing similar conferences regionally in different places, you know, that are focused kind of, uh, kind of around supporting local campaigns and local communities. Mm-hmm. Um, Portland is not the easiest place to get to uh, if you live in most of the country. So although a lot of people like to visit it, um, it's not maybe the most strategic place to have an alternative um, animal rights conference. For sure. Um, what are you guys' next steps with your, your the current vivisection campaign? Um, so coming up, uh, as we talked, we just got back from tour. We just had another march at the University of Washington, which had a few hundred people at it. Um, and now, you know, as we were saying earlier in this, it is kind of a time of looking towards the next few months. We've already announced that, um, we're having a Halloween weekend of action and again, encouraging cities all over the country to get involved in that. We're calling it Haunt Skanska and encouraging, um, office and home demos and whatever other mischief people want to engage and for celebrating Halloween with the campaign. Um, there's information up on our website and Facebook about that. Um, we've just barely started announcing that we're going to have a march on Skanska, and so there will be more information about that coming out pretty soon. Um, yeah, that's, so those are the big things that have been announced. Um, we're also, uh, like, literally right now, have been working on a campaign video so keep an eye out for that stuff. If you are fans of Shaq's Time for Action or Strike Back uh, type videos, then this is uh, this is for you people out there, basically. <laughs> uh, we'll be, uh, hopefully in the next few days, it'll be up online. Um, so we're going to probably be pushing that a lot for people to share that. Um, and that'll be our sort of promotional tool and uh, a way to get people pumped before they do action and before they... Uh, or if they want to get involved in the campaign. So we try to bring back some of the things. Those are the, that's some of the stuff that we do really like. About, again, like you asked earlier about what we take from Shaq. A lot of it is just the videos. <laughs> <laughs> um, for better or worse. Uh, they're just, I mean, we watch those still to get ourselves yeah. pumped up before we're yeah. going to go do a home demo or when, an office disruption. You know? On tour, one of the most, watched things in the car was watching time for action videos while we were driving. <laughs> so, so well, I mean, carry some of that on. they're cheesy, but there's a reason that people Fun. still talk about them. At least the, the few of us that still do talk about them. <laughs> <laughs> and, and videos now must be so much more easier to distribute. I mean, you can just put them yeah. right online and everyone can see them. Yep. Yep. Exactly. That, that's awesome. So what has been, um, Adam, Pro- I, I would probably pronounce it. Is it Sconsa, right? Mm-hmm. Um, what Skanska, is it? Yeah. I'm sorry. What was that? It's Sconsa. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sconsa. I can't talk. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what what has, what is their what is, is their reaction name. been really to, towards all the campaign? Trying to shut it out largely. Um, you know, traveling around the country, we got to see a taste of how they've responded in different places. Um, they all have. Their office is locked now. A lot of them have like key cards to get into them. Um, some have um, diff- other different forms of security. A lot of the executives have no trespassing signs in their yard. Um, they have tried to file restraining orders against people. Um, whenever they're asked for comment about it, they try to deflect that to the University of Washington and say, you know, like, they're the ones who are going to be torturing the animals, go talk to them. But it's like, no, you're building the place, you're highly accountable and all this. Um, so yeah, they've tried to, yeah, shut us out, try to effectively shut down some protests um, and deflect it to UW. But we, every time they try to do that to us, that's more motivation to show them that that's not going to work. They can't expect us to um, be silenced just because some corporation wants us to. Um, so, you know, we continue to just push back even harder um, and feel like we can push them to the point of deciding to drop the contract. So, the, so they've been kind of unwilling to have any any reasonable, like, discussion even about the topic? Oh, yeah. The, the most discussion that ever happened actually happened in Sweden, in Stockholm at their 
world headquarters um, where um, a Swedish animal rights group there organized a protest um, in solidarity with the week of action we were having um, in February. And they, uh, Skanska actually reached out to them. And this is most likely because they're very far removed from operations in Washington. Um, and so to, they pulled a PR move where the HR, uh, like top executive, set up a meeting with um, an executive vice president and that HR person. And they briefly talked with uh, Swedish activists about um, about the campaign, basically saying that they believe that University of Washington is doing um, important medical research and that they would look into um, our allegations or whatever they called it of animal exploitation and animal abuse that was going on. But in reality, that was just, um, you know, if, if we obviously know that Skanska doesn't really care, they'll build whatever they can build to make money. It's not at all about them supporting so-called medical progress. And they, FDA violations, they were giving information um, about specific animal protocol they know um, they basically just wanted to be able to 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 look a certain way um, in the spot in the public spotlight there in Sweden. None of that has happened in the United States at all. In fact, the immediate response here was um, lots of police, private yeah. security, private investigators right at the very beginning of the campaign. Um, and it was it was only within the first few months that the first restraining orders were even filed. And um, since then, it's been like, you know, local police in different areas responding very differently. Um, here, the, the police really don't like us in one of the neighborhoods that we do home demos. Um, and uh, we got arrested just for chalking outside the neighborhood there. Um, and that's, I mean, that's basically Ben Skanska's response is either they deflect to the police or they deflect to UW spokespeople, they act like they don't exist in this entire equation. Um, and so the response that we've had to that is to do everything we can to drag their name into it. So whenever we know we're going to get media, we make sure that we talk about Skanska. We make sure that there are signed banners that have Skanska's logo on them. Um, and we want to draw attention um, from the, the highest corporate executives that we can. And we also want the name to be associated with animal abuse at the next time they talk at, at their shareholders meeting, the next time they have to publish a quarterly report. Um, the people that invest in this company need to know what Skanska stands for. And so it's been sort of this back and forth struggle with them trying to stay out of the public spotlight and um, and us trying to do everything we can to drag them into it. What, what have been some of the things you guys um, look up to as wins along the way for this campaign? Um, I think... The first, I mean, just organizing mass demonstrations has been a really important victory, I think, for the movement, not just for the campaign. Mm -hmm. um, the last two marches that we had alone were uh, likely the biggest animal rights demonstrations in the United States in a decade. Mm -hmm. um, where, you know, that same weekend, I think, uh, activists in Israel mobilized 15,000 people. Um, we don't playing off of that um, history anymore. We were able to get those kinds of numbers in the 80s, some in the early 90s, um, but it's very hard to turn out those kinds of numbers as grassroots animal rights organizers. And I think just being able to do that without branding ourselves with, with PETA or with MFA or some other group um, is a huge victory. And I think that the whole movement should be able to accept that as something as like a turning point, maybe a watershed moment for us moving forward as a movement. Um, I don't know if you would. Yeah, so we also, like, pretty early on in this campaign, we had people involved in over a dozen cities doing protests, um, and that was pretty amazing to see, as well as people in Sweden and Finland doing protests. Um, so it's really cool to be able to start laying the groundwork for national networking and being able to have people in multiple cities is able to work on stuff and call on each other at a grassroots level. Also, we've been told, and this is um, obviously we can say it's more of an alley. We've been told by uh, by police <laughs> that that we've cost Skanska thousands, tens of thousands of dollars. I mean, we know that from the lockdown that happened 
uh, on June 1st, where people stopped work for 12 hours straight by locking to an excavator, um, the police told us that uh, only a few hours into the workday, we had cost them $20,000. And we know that when they hire security at every one of their locations around the country in anticipation for the tour, we know that they meet with, uh, you know, private security firms in their offices. We know they have to schedule meetings with police. All of that, we view that as a victory because it's becoming an increasing headache for them financially and uh, just in terms of their day-to-day lives. Um, and, if, and if it's true that that campaign is costing them tens of thousands of dollars, then that's exactly what you know the point of the pressure campaign really is, is to really create more pressure to stop the contract because it's more of a headache and it's going to become more costly than they had first anticipated when they accepted it, um, than to continue doing the construction and to ultimately build the lab. And so hearing those things, I mean, I think we should accept that as a victory and not be afraid to say that, like, we want to cost them money. And Skanska is a corporation that has shown um, in its history that it cares a lot about its reputation. Um, they've pulled out of other projects that are a lot bigger than this one when they have been pulled into negative media spotlight. So, you know, as I we was saying earlier, like, you know, having them in the media associated with animal cruelty, animal torture that would happen in this lab if they build it, um, that also is, yeah, a victory with this. So what have, what have students' reactions been and how has the u- university been handling things? Um, so we've been in touch with there's the student animal rights group um, that, um, of course, with student groups, there's change in leadership every year. Um, so we are in touch with the um, person who's kind of coming into that role this year. Um, they're excited to um, talk with us about what more they can do on campus, ideas that they have for getting more students involved. They participated in the march. Um They've done some talks on campus about animal research, and we had more students this time participating in the march. The uh, student paper has done some really supportive articles, and even they even made a video about the campaign that was great. Mm -hmm. Um, So from the students, there's a lot of support for the campaign. It is a very... um, research oriented school so unfortunately that means a lot of students are involved in the health sciences there and have been like brainwashed into thinking that animal research is um a necessary thing at the school but um it is a huge student body and so we are seeing that you know outside of those little groups of students a lot of people are not into the idea of animal research, animals being tortured on their campus, and a lot of people wanting to get involved. How how did they react to the march? The students? Yeah. Or the university? A little of both. Um, <laughs> do, both? Well, yeah. the university does the typical thing. <laughs> they um, They say they support free speech. <laughs> but the lab is necessary. I mean, that's basically their talking point every single time. Mm-hmm. Um, and so they they don't really try to engage with the media anymore. Um, but we know from hearing just about how much they are meeting with like Skanska and Seattle and UW police departments that it's clearly affecting them. And that's not just the march. That's, that's all sorts of stuff um, regarding the campaign in, in, in Seattle in particular. The students, um, like Amanda said, they've become more engaged, I think, over the course of the campaign. There are definitely people, uh, this last March was on a school day, and we chose that day in particular because it was one of the first days of class. Um, It was part of their, uh, like, first week returning, like, festivities at UW. Mm -hmm. Um, And so, typical of, like, the frat bros at UW, we got, you know, people saying mocking things, but we also got a lot of people being supportive on campus. We had people um, saying they wish they could join us and all this stuff that were um, like headed to class and things like that. And I, I think it's, it's a pretty mixed bag though, realistically to reiterate what Amanda said. I mean, it's, we're going up against a university that is known for biomedical research. Um, and so there's a lot of people there that that are on this very one, they have a one track mind and they're on a very uh, determined path to become people that do animal research. So um, I think that you're either doing it or you might have a friend who's doing it and you don't know how, how exactly to balance 
the conflicting feelings about not supporting animal abuse, but also thinking that this is important for, for human health. And I think that's probably true of every university vivisection campaign. Um, and, you know, but I think the difference is, is that we're, we're not just doing home demonstrations and we love, we love doing home demonstrations. We do a lot of them, but we're also mobilizing the masses. We're, we're mobilizing the general population of people that want to get involved to just, just come out. They don't have to be vegan. They don't have to be, um, you know, radical animal liberationists or something like that. But if they're against the lab, then join us at these demonstrations. And so we allow for different outlets and we can, we can gain more public sympathy that way than if we were just doing things like home demonstrations. And so I think that's been useful as well. And also, even though the UW being like a major research university can make some things with the campaign trickier, it also makes the campaign more important because if we're able to stop a lab from being built at a major research institution, that's something that the whole industry is going to pay attention to, which makes it all the more important for people to recognize the importance of getting involved in this campaign in whatever way they're able to. And I'd imagine that it's it's hard to ignore like the sheer number of people that are involved in something, especially like at the march. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's, it's also been, it generates a pretty, when we do things like the march or we have things like those actions, it generates a ton of media pressure on them to have to make a comment about why that, why it is they're even going through with expanding an animal research program that already brings in $500 million a year. Mm -hmm. And I think that there are a lot of people just asking why they're bothering to invest in that. Yeah, with the public, the university for a while has tried to, you know, put out this idea that the university um, is trying to move away from animal research and invest in other alternatives. Yeah, we've done lots of public records requests and we have the documents that are between the heads of the animal research department and other leadership figures at the university. And you can see how the they are not actually trying to move away from using animals. They are plotting to, they have like a 15 year expansion plan with this lab being the first part of that to continue to expand the number of animals um, that they are using at the university. And they're also very explicit about um, this lab expansion as well as subsequent stuff being because they want to get more grant money. And it's all very clearly motivated by wanting more animals so they can get more money. And uh, another thing which we should have mentioned when you asked about um, uh, actual tangible victories in the campaign was we the lawsuit that Amanda mentioned earlier, oh, yeah. we won that lawsuit against the regents. And so, I mean, a judge ruled that the regents had violated Washington's Open Public Meetings Act 24 separate times. Those included the meetings that they were discussing this lab um, they intentionally had those meetings, like instead of having them in open public meetings, like they were supposed to during their public meeting times, they were having secret meetings at the UW president's mansion. Um, and so the lawsuit ruling was that that was illegal and that the mm-hmm. regents had violated the OPMA. And so I think that a media story came out about that the day before our first March. And I, I think it really made a lot of the public wonder why they were having secret meetings about the lab. And it it became very much enshrouded in the secrecy. And that's when the university had to basically step away from their current narrative about we're, you know, this was a very public process and we we want the public's opinion about, you know, how we're going to go forward with our our biomedical research and and all this stuff to, to having to shorten their talking points to basically being like, we support free speech and we, uh, also support um, the building of this facility because it's going to help save human lives because they could no longer maintain that they weren't doing something in secret, that they weren't being kind of sketchy, honestly, about the development of the project. And Skanska was totally a part of that. They were The, the meetings in which they uh, were developing the contract with Skanska were part of those 24 um, secret illegal meetings. And so we, we know that they are, have lost a little bit of the trust they once had um, that was front page story of the Seattle Times, the day that that happened. And so, all, I mean, and the repercussions are not just regarding the lab, they're for all sorts of things um, about public meetings law in the state of Washington. And so it made this big rippling effect about why are UW regents so secretive? Why are they being so conniving? 
Well, I can't believe it. We're we're already at an hour. Um, I just I just want to say I absolutely love what you are doing. Um, I feel like you're kind of breathing a, a new, fresh breath into grassroots activism that the Alma Rights community desperately needs. And it reminds me of why I got into activism, you know, those 20 years ago. So thank you. It's, it's truly amazing and, and inspirational. Well, thank you thank for you. taking the time to speak with us. Yeah. Um, how can people follow your work, get in contact and actually get into the streets? Um, well, you can go to our website. It's no new animal lab dot com. Um, and we're also on Facebook, Twitter, Tumblr, Instagram, all that stuff, YouTube. Vimeo. Uh, yeah, <laughs> so all that stuff. Um, you can find email at us on there. It's just info at no new animal lab dot com. And you can also um, find us individually on Facebook and things. Um, so yeah, if people want to get involved, um, you can either look at the information on our website or Facebook and see different events that are planned or other things that you can do like letter writing. Um, or we're always happy to have people, uh, email us to get in touch and we can talk about ideas. Um, if there's things you have ideas about, or you're not sure what you want to do, um, whether you have a Skanska office, near you or you don't like we have things that everyone can do to get involved so please do get in touch well we we end every episode saying fuck shit damn would you both mind saying that for us this week let me clarify fuck shit, shit. down damn. damn oh fuck shit okay sure we can do that <laughs> are we saying it together or like individually <laughs> however you want to do it I'll, I'll just do it together. Yeah. Ready? <laughs> Fuck, Fuck shit, shit damn. damn. Awesome. Sweet. Thank you, Thank so, you much. so much. Thank, Thank you. you all. You both have a wonderful night. This week you heard All Through the Night by Emancipator. Right now you're listening to La Bella Swing by Karab Steller. Right now I would love to read a review that someone left on iTunes. But no, no one did. No, no reviews. One? No, no reviews. N- no even ratings this week. What? I know. That's not cool, guys. No, it's not cool at all. But, you know, if you got this far, I'm assuming you like the content. Um, please consider, you know, rating and reviewing us on iTunes. It really helps the show. And, you know, you're getting it for free. In- unless you're one of the awesome people to help donate and everything else but if you're not one of those people you know, consider helping out the show in in the small little way that you can which is reagan reviewing us on itunes if for some reason you don't have itunes or you've already rated and reviewed us how about share the episode on your social media or share the podcast on your social media that'd be cool too cool 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 speaking of social media we're on it And you should be too, by being our friend, liking us, following us, obeying us, worshiping us on all the platforms out there, pretty much. I mean, everything you said minus two of those things, but we won't say which two. Following us and liking us. (laughs) (laughs) So be our friend. Uh, Go to wishsidepodcast.com, click on the social tab for all of our social goodness. Social goodness. I like that. We're socially aware. This is a social justice podcast. So we have social media. And we're very social in our approach. And we're not very social in real life. So just so say the fuck away from me. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of fuck, shit damn. Which Side Podcast is hosted and produced by Jordan Halliday and Jeremy Parkin of the Which Side Media Collective, with web design by Jordan Halliday and sound design by Jeremy Parkin. Booking by Mari Halliday. Theme music by Commandantes. Go to wishsidecollective.org to check out the other shows in the collective. As always, fuck shit damn. (laughs) 